Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to Executive Function for Today's Students and Tomorrow's Leaders, a webinar sponsored by Studio, the Proactive School and Life Achievement System. A little bit about me to get started. My name is Roxanne Desforges, and uh, I started out as a high school math entrepreneurship and ethics teacher. Uh, I then went on to complete my master's in education and spent the following five years working in the ed tech industry uh, as an implementation specialist, ensuring that technology was really being properly incorporated into the classroom um, in order to uh, really share meaningful pedagogy um, and help schools really achieve their goals. Um, during that time, I learned a lot about the role technology can play in transforming behavior uh, and building good habits. Um, I'm currently working on my doctoral research at McGill University uh, on the future of work and the implications for schooling and curriculum. Uh, I also teach the educational technology course to pre-service teachers at McGill, where I spend a good amount of time talking about uh, how to best evaluate and integrate educational technology products into the classroom. Um, so the perspective that I'm bringing uh, to executive function today is really one of implementation and, ensure, and ensuring that the strategies that we decide to focus on really result in the desired impact that we're all looking for. Um, so the outline for today's webinar uh, comes in three parts. So first, we'll discuss what is executive function and how can it help students and schools. Second, we'll discuss, you know, where are we going wrong with executive function implementation in schools? And third, I'll provide a model that I believe can really help to promote executive function school-wide and overcome a lot of the pitfalls we'll mention in part two. Um, so this model covers pedagogy, technology, and school culture. So to begin, what is executive function and how can it help our students in school? Um, well, first, the truth is that um, there is a little bit of debate as to how we can describe executive function. Specifically, there are different fields of practice that use different terminology, but most people agree um, that executive function is really an umbrella term used to describe skills that regulate our behavior and our thinking. Um, Harvard's Center on Developing the Child uses this really helpful analogy that I like to use, which is to really think of our brains as air traffic controllers. So our brain's ability to actually hold on to work uh, and hold on to information, work with information to focus our thinking and to filter distraction and kind of switch gears as we take on different tasks um, is a lot like having a you know, highly effective air traffic controller in our brains managing dozens of planes on the runway. And so our capacity to do this, uh, it really relies on three types of brain function. It's working memory, which is our ability to uh, retain and manipulate distinct pieces of information. Second, uh, mental flexibility, which is our ability to sustain or shift attention. And third, self-control, which is our ability to prioritize and resist impulsive actions. So what happens if we don't promote executive function in school? What are some of the deficiencies that we might be able to notice in our students? Well, obvious two, two main and, and sort of obvious examples that we'll wanna be focusing on are math and literacy, two crucial areas in the curriculum. And in terms of deficiencies when it comes to math, um, it really is the student's inability to show their work when they're doing math problems. It's their inability to remember step-by-step -step processes in solving problems as well. It's their inability to check and review their work effectively as well. Um, when it comes to writing and, and literacy, uh, we see that students struggle to initiate a writing assignment. So coming up with ideas for um, a piece or for a paragraph or an essay um, can be really challenging for students that have executive function deficiencies. Um, the ability to organize their ideas, especially in an argumentative format or an essay format where they're trying to build an argument and make a point um, is also very challenging for these kids. And lastly, identifying 
the right kinds of evidence to actually support the points that they're trying to make. So um, all in all, writing can become incredibly challenging for students with executive functioning deficiencies because all of the, all of the deficiencies are just mentioned are sort of core um, to literacy. Um, in reading, it's the ability to retain what they read. So actually remembering the information uh, that they are reading and identifying main points or main arguments in what they're reading. So when it comes to studying, um, in that case, executive function deficiencies really get in the way of students retaining and applying the information that they, um, that they are reading. Um, behaviorally, in our classrooms as teachers, we'll see um, a lot of uh, impulsive actions in our students that are struggling with executive deficiency. Um, and these are the kids that will typically get labeled, you know, the bad kids. And uh, the problem is that, the, the problem with that is that we really, um, we can't see when a student is struggling with executive function. So um, it's important to acknowledge that um, these are not intentional actions. When a student has um, executive function deficiencies, they might be acting in all kinds of different ways that um, from the teacher's perspective are inappropriate, but they're not intentional. And so this is why we really need to, um, you know, think about other ways of addressing this issue and probably avoid um, punitive approaches or um, labeling of students. And so the only way to really support our students through all of this is to promote executive function um, in, in our students who need extra help, but also in our higher performing students who are struggling with, with stress, with anxiety, um, and who need that support along the way as well. So executive function at the end of the day will be promoting our students' ability to get college and career ready. And that is true both of our high performing and our lower performing students. Um, and I'm sure if you're here, if you're listening to this webinar, then you agree and you wanna know what you can do about it. And so that's what, what we'll move on to. Um, in our day to day, if we nurture young people, if we nurture executive function skills, then it's really the ability for our young students to act in a goal-directed manner, which really just means the simple ability for them to follow instructions when asked. You know, if a teacher says, go put your shoes away in the cubby hole, then it's their ability to, to get up immediately and actually execute on that action. Um, it also feels like the child's ability to stop performing an action when asked. So if you're, if you're a teacher and you've been in a classroom, then you've gone through this about a million times. You've asked your students to to stop talking or to stop making noise or to stop whatever it is they're doing and pay attention to you. And so some of the students that are um, lagging behind in those moments are potentially also the students that are struggling with executive function. So just a little something to think about and to give us all a little bit more perspective uh, when it comes to, to um, making judgments about the observations we see in our classrooms. Um, it's also the ability to, to choose a strategy and a task and solve problems. So executive function is really helping our younger students with um, all aspects of, of their behavior that might help or promote their ability to do well in school. Um, as our students get older, uh, it really does become their ability to uh, remember and follow instructions, avoid distraction and control their impulses, adjust or shift when things change. So, you know, as we all know, as adults, sometimes things don't go according to plan and your ability to sort of accept that and move on um, with whatever new plan is in place um, is definitely a sign of, of strong executive function skills. Um, it's the ability to persist at seeking solutions after failure, so not giving up. It's that grit aspect that we often talk about. Um, the ability to plan and organize complex projects which is definitely something that we're wanting to promote as a, as a career skill. Um, the ability to develop good study habits, manage long-term assignments, and really um, break down longer-term assignments into more manageable tasks um, and be able to accomplish them. Uh, it's the ability to initiate working on tasks. So as we mentioned earlier with respect to writing essays and coming up with ideas, sometimes getting started is really the biggest obstacle with any schoolwork. Um, and so it's the ability to really jump in and get started. 
Um, and then lastly, it's the ability to self-monitor and reflect on your work to think about how well you are doing and maybe think about how you can adjust your performance based on results that you've received from a teacher. Um, all of this in turn translates directly to core academic tasks that all of our students need to be able to do um, if they want to see success in school and if they do want to be getting college and career ready then this translates directly into the ability to read long and short form texts write essays conduct research give presentations coordinate and complete group projects work on independent projects and of course take tests and so um, it's easy to see how this list of um, tasks are essentially the core academic tasks that students do um, across grade levels and across subject areas and so executive function at the end of the day is uh, crucial to success in education um, and so that's uh, why we really need to focus on promoting it in in all the ways that we will uh, as we go forward so if we promote executive function, as I mentioned, academic achievement um, will result. We'll also notice that students make better choices with respect to their health and their nutrition and their um, desire to exercise. We'll see positive behavior in terms of how they are collaborating with their fellow students inside and outside the classroom. And all in all, this also will result in being um, better prepared for the workforce or employment. So being really well organized and having the skills to solve problems in, in the workforce and uh, just plan and adjust to different things that will come about. Because as we know, um, sometimes we, we learn about how to, to do work tasks in school and they're very formulaic and they're very sort of, you know, step by step. But when we actually enter the workforce, things don't always, again, go according to plan. And so the ability to really adapt is going to be crucial to that, uh, to that part of their lives. Um, the good news is that we can train executive function as we grow. So for those of you who are watching, who are perhaps a little bit older than the K-12 students that we, uh, that we are talking about now, don't worry, even you can improve your executive function um, because it is something that you can train. Um, what we are born with is the ability to develop it. And so we all have some potential here to grow and that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. So some enablers, um, the key enablers uh, the three main factors that we believe impact a student's ability to develop executive function um, include their relationships with adults, their experiences in the in the classroom, but also, um, you know, in the school, in the schoolyard, it can be anywhere, um, really, uh, on school premises, and of course, um, their environment. So the classroom, what does it look like? What kind of space uh, can they take up within that environment? So Positive relationships with adults, to begin, uh, need to be supportive. They need to model and practice executive function skills within those relationships. They need to be consistent and reliable and trusting. Students really need to feel safe in those relationships, like they can try and test things out and, and practice and fail also um, within, within the bonds of those relationships. They also need to be able to guide students from total dependence on the, the adult to gradual independence so that they can, of course, develop the skills, but then apply and be able to flourish on their own. Um, experiences that promote executive functions are ones that foster uh, social connections and open-ended creative play. They incorporate lots of physical exercise, something we'll continue to touch on throughout the presentation. Physical exercise is a crucial component of developing executive function. And then lastly, um, again, increasing the complexity of skills and challenge gradually over time is a, a great way to help each and every individual experience that a student goes through at school to promote executive function. Uh, lastly, spaces or environments need to feel safe um, and they need to be safe and feel safe. So those are kind of two different things, but at the end of the day, it's the student's 
perception of the environment that is really going to determine whether or not they can um, you know, practice and, and promote executive function. Uh, so we do need to check in with them and make sure that that's how they feel, not only how we have set up the space to be. Um, and lastly, they really need to make room for uh, creative exploration and again, exercise. So all of these three things together, if we are covering them and if we are thinking about them as we create a plan for promoting executive function in school, um, then we'll have all of our bases covered. Um, so where are we currently going wrong? Where are, where, what are the ways in which that um, common or popular approaches to addressing executive function in school, where are we seeing or where are the studies showing that actually we might have some blind spots or we might be missing out on some things there? So um, typically schools will promote executive function through pedagogy, which makes perfect sense. It's the most direct way in which um, students and teachers interact. Um, and so there's a perfectly good reason for that. Um, the problem is, however, that despite these great efforts, we're still not seeing the impact that we want to see. Um, studies show that there are implementation problems when it comes to executive function. So we're seeing that um, there is a lack of consistency uh, in the practices that promote executive function in a given class. We're seeing a lack of consistency across classes and across teachers in different contexts. So what that means is that as, a, as an administrator, as a school leader, you'll want to promote um, specific strategies and behaviors within your staff and that those need to be consistently applied by them uh, no matter the course they teach, no matter the, um, the, the subject that they're, that they're addressing, no matter the exercises that they're going through in their class. Uh, next is that repeated practice is really necessary and essential over time. So you might not see those results immediately. It might take time for you to develop executive function in all your students, but the earlier you start with them and the longer that goes on um, as they move on from grade to grade and that consistent application is there, that is how you will really ensure that you see the results that you want to see. And then lastly, Another uh, issue that we're seeing very commonly with, with sort of pitfalls in executive function implementation is really with the um, school home divide. So even if we promote executive function really well in school and parents don't mirror that at home, then we won't see that benefit as well because there'll be a drop off rate, um, which you can also assume will take place sometimes over the course of a summertime. Um, and so really ensuring that parents are kept in the know and that they're well aware of, of the prioritization of executive function and that they have skills and uh, strategies in place at home um, is also essential. So the, the model that I'm proposing is really one that can help us to overcome the challenges that I've just mentioned and help um, uh, leaders and administrators to ensure that they don't have any of these blind spots and that they're applying all of this, um, you know, consistently, regularly, and at home and at school. And so my proposal for um, creating such a strategy for your own school is really to address pedagogy, technology, and school culture. And so if you do take this three-pronged approach, I believe that you will um, reduce the number of blind spots you have and develop a more holistic and consistent strategy for addressing executive function in your school so that you can receive, see the results that you want to be achieving through these strategies and help your students get college and career ready. At the end of the day, that is what we all want. So um, this approach uh, really involves a reinforcement model. So going from pedagogy only to actually reinforcing everything that you're doing with your pedagogy through educational technology, and again, through a culture that you can build within your school by having uh, staff and uh, students, parents, and basically everyone involved really reinforcing all of those uh, steps. And so this approach um, I will be reviewing uh, within the following sections of the, the webinar and hopefully giving you a lot of really practical um, ways that you can implement this within your own school. So I'll begin by sharing some strategies um, that you can, 
use within a pedagogical context. So these are some strategies that teachers can be using within their own classrooms. We'll discuss activities teachers can do. And of course, study tips that you can be sharing with your students um, to, to help them get ready for some of those crucial moments in their academic careers, like assignments and tests. So the first strategy um, that is a really great one for promoting executive function in the classroom is storytelling. So really just, um, you know, either yourself as a teacher telling stories or providing opportunities for students to share their own stories and have an exchange in the classroom orally allows them to use their working memory. Um, and oral language is, is highly correlated with executive function as a result of this practice. And on the flip side, listening is also um, really helpful for acquiring oral language and supporting vocabulary use. So really just giving students this opportunity to both listen and uh, engage in their own storytelling in the classroom. Uh, next is guided practice. So guided practice really supports that gradual independence uh, and application of, of learning that I mentioned earlier. So guided practice, as, as most of us know, will involve um, introducing a concept to students or introducing an idea, then you know, providing them with examples of how that might be done, and then gradually allowing them to practice that on their own. Um, and in doing this, you're increasing in incrementally a challenge. You're also personalizing that challenge to each and every single one of your students. Um, and the trick with all of this is really to make sure that it's not, you know, too easy for your students, because if it's too easy, then they get bored. And if it's too challenging, then they become frustrated. And so finding that middle ground is really um, is really where the teacher's skill lies in, in executing on this strategy. Explicit modeling um, is another really important strategy for promoting executive function in the classroom. So, you know, most teachers are aware that modeling the kinds of behavior we want to see in our students is one of the best ways um, for us to, to encourage our students to behave in different ways. Um, but explicit modeling really involves taking modeling to the next level and actually talking through um, the thing that you are doing out loud. So for example, if I, um, if I want to you know, use my own experience as a teachable moment, then I, I'm writing something on the board, perhaps some notes for my students, and I realize that I've messed up. So I need to you know, erase what I've written and, and start again. So instead of getting um, frustrated in that moment in order to model the right behavior, you would, um, you would just, you know, collect yourself and, and rewrite it down. Um, but to model explicitly, what you'll want to do is actually say it out loud. So as you got stuck, you'll say, oh, I see I've, I've made a mistake here. Well, instead of getting frustrated, what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase what I wrote on the board and start again. And actually saying those words out loud as you enact the behavior allows your students to understand that this is a teachable moment and I'm sharing with you exactly what you need to be doing. So removing the element of will they, won't they notice and actually giving it straight to them is um, the best way to go about this. Lastly, of course, direct instruction. Um, is still to this day one of the best ways to ensure that your students are, are practicing and, and promoting executive function in the classroom is really by just addressing it directly. Talk to your students about executive function. Focus on study skills. Let that be a, a component of whatever course you are teaching. And when you do that, you definitely, um, you know, avoid any risk of uh, leaving it up to interpretation or to chance. So really just going for it directly. Um, next, I'll just share some activities that you can be doing in your classroom that actually promote executive function. These may come as a surprise, um, some may not, uh, but games, games are incredibly helpful for promoting executive function and card games can be really great, especially with our younger students. Um, they can promote uh, exercising working memory, uh, mental flexibility, uh, and also planning and strategy. So I'm sure we all know games like hearts or spades or bridge. Um, and these games are all popular examples that can definitely allow a student to use and practice those skills. Um, any game also involving, uh, you know, uh, puzzles or, or, or any kind of strategy can also include these kinds of games. 
Crossword puzzles are another great example. Sudoku, for those of you who, who are math teachers watching, um, these are all great ways of promoting mental flexibility as well. Um, dramatic exercises are another one. So performances involving remembering lines um, and set direction requires focus and exercising again, working memory, but also managing timing and collaborating with others are hugely important when it comes to, um, you know, really formal dramatic exercises. On the flip side, improvisation is also another great way um, that requires a little bit less planning, a little less uh, upfront work, but does require a tremendous amount of creative thinking um, and anticipating the reactions of others, which is really beneficial for building confidence and ultimately empathizing with your fellow students. So this is another great um, activity that you can incorporate into a number of different classes. Um, so definitely think about that. Uh, journaling is another great activity that you can use to foster executive function with your students. It promotes self-reflection, which is uh, really essential for exploring thoughts and feelings and actions. And dedicating time to reflection is an incredibly important way to show students that, you know, these skills matter. Um, and it really is about giving time to these kinds of activities that will allow them to um, think about their future and think about, you know, how, what are the steps they need to take to get from where they currently are to where they want to be. And encouraging that kind of thinking is really essential for promoting executive function. Lastly, physical activity, as I mentioned, exercise is crucial uh, to promoting executive function um, because it allows students to, to focus, it enables their ability to monitor um, and evaluate their behavior and their actions. Um, sports are great for promoting quick analysis and decision making, you know, is that ball coming towards me? Is it not? What can I do um, to get the ball? Um, so the ability to respond appropriately to the actions of others and play on a team, but also uh, to engage in activities that are more um, independent or solo. So uh, things like yoga, which can also help to reduce stress which is another factor that can really promote executive function, just constant stress reduction, stress reduction feeling safe. Um, these are all enablers. So lastly, I'll jump into some study tips um, that are really helpful to actually just go ahead and share with your students. The study tips are ones that can be applied across subject areas, across grade levels. So um, really more universal kinds of study tips that do promote executive function. So study tip one is to break down a project into manageable tasks or manageable pieces so that a large task or a large project doesn't feel as um, challenging to get started. Because as we know, getting started can be a bit of a challenge for students that have executive function deficiencies. So enabling them to always approach every task that they, that they come to as a, as a first step is to just break it down and then create a timeline um, for a, attacking each and every single one of those steps is a great way to get started with, with any um, assignment or test. Next, we have study tip number two, self-talk when you're stuck. So self-talk is all about asking yourself questions. It's about asking yourself you know, if I have an assignment, do I really know the instructions? Do I understand the instructions? Um, asking yourself, you know, are there words that I don't really understand within the, within the explanation? Um, who can I ask for help? And, you know, would reviewing my notes help? And just walking yourself through a process. Um, this prevents uh, anxiety which is something that we often encounter when we're struggling with an assignment or when we're struggling with uh, you know, a deadline or anything that's causing stress in that way um, and is a great way to, to alleviate roadblocks or obstacles that seem insurmountable. So helping students to practice that regularly is another great way, uh, another great study tip. Three is knowing when to focus. So, don't multitask when you're studying for an important test. Um, in other words, you know, we all know that there's you know, some assignments that are uh, less important than others or some assignments that are more important than others. So your, your weekly uh, homework may not be as crucial as you know, a final exam. So 
helping students to make those evaluations and know when it is especially important to really focus, to find a quiet space, to create an environment where they know they can study at length. Um, bring snacks is always a good thing to do so that you don't have to leave the room and get distracted. So preventing, you know, eliminating reasons to leave and to, to change your mind and to, to be distracted is, is study tip number three. Study tip number four involves, um, you know, using calendars as much as possible, keeping track of time, breaking down steps and having them actually listed in a calendar is incredibly helpful for studying. To look at them frequently and to keep them by your side as much as possible is absolutely essential for promoting executive function, but also for supporting students that are struggling with executive function. So no matter what, calendars, timeline, breaking down steps, these are essential skills. Uh, study tip number five is mnemonic devices. So um, these can help students um, use, their, use their memory to support, um, to support preparation for a test or for an examination. So come up with letter patterns to help you remember, like RAP is a common one that's used in ELA, um, and that is to restate the question, answer the question, prove your answer with evidence, and proofread your answer. So RAP will remind you what the process is um, to, to go through when you're in that examination and just keep you on track. Um, and these kinds of um, mnemonic devices can be used also very frequently in math to remember the, the, the process um, of, of the work that you need to do. And so these are really great ways um, to help you prepare for an examination. Um, the last tip is to reflect, recycle, and discard. So after completing an assignment, Reflecting on what you did um, and what did what worked and what didn't work well, you know, tell the students to think about ways to ensure that these supports are in place um, for other projects and, you know, what was learned from assignments that were not completed or well done. What did you well, what did you do well and what needs some rethinking are, um, are essential steps that actually should follow the completion of all assignments and all tests. Um, so that students can really think about and keep their, their minds on the fact that this is a constant journey. Um, no matter what, they do need to um, keep that growth mindset, you know, in mind and, and realize that this is, you know, a process by which they will be over time improving um, and that it isn't the end of the world or the be all end all if, you know, one assignment went poorly. So again, relating it back to stress and managing stress and anxiety. So our next step um, is about finding the right tools. So uh, thinking about you know, uh, educational technology now, um, so moving from pedagogy to educational technology and thinking about what are the tools or what is that reinforcement layer that we can introduce that can really support all of the um, more pedagogical strategies that you can use. So when you're thinking about introducing an educational technology tool within your classroom, especially focusing on executive function, you want to keep in mind all the skills that you want to be promoting. So this uh, here is the list that I was mentioning earlier about the, the list of executive function skills. So if I'm looking for a tool, I want to keep this in mind because that tool should in some way, shape or form address uh, some of these skills. Um, then the next thing that you can do is, is translate those skills into product features. And so that's a good way to think about, you know, um, how will I evaluate different tools that can help me to promote executive function or reinforce the pedagogical strategies that we'll be implementing in our school. Um, so some of these include uh, the ability to see everything in context, uh, foresight to plan work around all other tasks, indicators for when to start school work, ways to self-monitor and track my progress, uh, autonomy to enter uh, their own tasks and to uh, get their own tasks started, the ability to view uh, new tasks received from teachers, uh, to the ability to break work into smaller steps, as I've mentioned earlier, is just incredibly crucial, and the ability to mark work as done, which is you know, a moment for the student to say, 
I got this done, good for me, on to the next thing, and really have a sense of accomplishment there. And so these are some of the things that, you know, uh, any teacher or any administrator looking for a tool that can promote executive function would want to keep their eyes open to. And so when I was looking for a tool such as this, I fell upon Studio, um, which was, uh, you know, specifically designed as a proactive school and life achievement system, which um, is really basically a tool that can help students, uh, you know, focus on um, their executive function and develop those skills through the use of a tool that they would need to use in their everyday already. So what you're getting here is, is a bit of a, a bit of a two in one. So you're, you've got the ability to track and, and manage your progress, um, but also promote at the same time executive function skills. And when I fell upon Studio, one of the first questions I asked the CEO was, you know, why did you build this? Um, and, and how did it come to you? Um, and so he told me this story about the impact the digital transition was having on executive function development um, in students that he had observed. And um, this is kind of the story that he told. Basically, you know, back in the day, we all had these planners, the, the one that you see here. Um, you know, some of you may still even, even have some of these planners in your schools. Um, and you may recall the user experience, right, of the planner, which was that, um, you know, a teacher would write something on the board or, um, or maybe even say the assignment or the homework or, you know, give out the information out loud. And then students in turn would have to open up, you know, open up their agendas, find the right date and take down those notes and write down, you know, what they were going to be doing how and when they would have to break it down into steps. You know, when am I gonna study? How am I gonna get this done? And um, all teachers had this exact same process. So it was really uniform and it was really consistent. And the simple act of, of writing down a teacher's expectations um, and tasks to get done and the deadlines and all these crucial components allowed students to regularly exercise their executive function skills. Um, and it gave students the, the ability to develop a sense of autonomy and responsibility with respect to their assignments. And the problem happens when we go through a digital transition and now we have one-to-one -one devices and we eliminate the paper planners and school has, schools um, are using tools that have a digital interface uh, and these are platforms where homework and tests and assignments are actually being pushed by teachers to students. Um, and so now students become viewers of assignments and viewers of, of homework. Um, and so in the best case scenario, this is the, the new sort of post-digital transition workflow, which is you've got teachers of all the different subject areas pushing to-dos or pushing assignments and tests to students, ideally in a common web platform, but as we know, um, in many schools where we're trying to motivate teachers to actually, you know, get involved in technology and adopt technology. So we're often making exceptions to teachers and allowing them to use, you know, different tools that they want. We often have some teachers that are lagging behind. And this does tend to create uh, an inconsistency in the way that students are accessing their resources. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, what it is doing is it is eliminating this important moment, um, this important teachable moment that did take place beforehand, which was that the students would actually write down the information themselves. They would take down what was important. They would break down their tasks into, into manageable steps, uh, assign deadlines to individual tasks. Um, and so this moment has really been eliminated um, through the digital transition. And so what Studio is trying to do is obviously to overcome this major hurdle. Um, a major hurdle that is really only accentuated by the fact that teachers often try to sort of come up with hacked solutions to this fact. So sometimes we see this with the use of a calendar. Um, uh, and I'm sure we've all been there. You've used your calendar to sort of manage your tasks. The problem is that calendars were not really designed um, as task management systems. So here you run into uh, quite a bit of trouble, um, you know, with, with a calendar. So it can look, 
you know, really helpful when it's just managing your, your classes, but then you add tasks to the equation and this is what calendars start to look like. And this is definitely, you know, adding to the problem when it comes to executive function because a student who's got executive function deficiencies, who's looking at this calendar is just like, I'm never going to do anything. I'm never even going to get any of this started. And so really, um, you know, the, the, the challenge that Studio is trying to solve or the obstacle that they're trying to remove is, is everything that has resulted from, you know, this digital transition that's resulted in a lot of sort of awkward attempts to, to promote executive function or to get organized um, in a digital sphere. And so this is what Studio looks like. This is what Studio is, is doing to sort of, you know, acknowledge the fact that calendars are helpful and acknowledge the fact that, you know, uh, dates and times and, and the calendar aspect is incredibly useful, but also uh, put it, create it in a way where students can actually see what they're looking for. They can breathe, they can look at this and not feel, you know, stress and anxiety. They can manage their tasks in a very visual way, which is incredibly helpful for students that are struggling with um, executive function deficiencies. So this is a weekly view that we're looking at here. Um, and Stelio's goal, as I mentioned, was really to clean up and perfectly adapt um, to all types of specific schedules. So actually, um, you can create your own schedule, no matter what your bell times are, no matter what kind of schedule you're using within your school, um, you can actually customize this um, platform to look exactly the way that you want it to, to mirror your own schedule. And it can aggregate and sync all of the teacher information from their own calendars or, or other platforms like Google Classroom. But beyond just providing a centralized system that is clear and easy to use, their most important goal was to return the agency and the ownership of planning, organize, and learning back to students. And that's what Studio is really all about, is about giving students back their agency and making them masters of their own learning and giving them that confidence to, to do it while they're in school and to build it such that they can do it well beyond um, graduation. So by simply using Studio as your school's organizational tool, students and teachers exercise their executive function skills daily. Um, and so I'm gonna show you how that happens right now. So uh, here we have um, uh, a student looking at their month at a glance now. Um, we're zoomed in on a, on a specific task, which is indicated visually um, with the red star. And a red star always symbolizes an important task, so probably a test of some kind. Um, so that's already the first way that Studio is giving visual cues to students to, to know where their tasks are and to be able to identify at a glance what is going on this month, what are the important things that I need to do. Um, so students... Um, can indicate this themselves. So these can be pushed to students by teachers or students can create these um, on their own. Uh, so this is a quick and easy way for students to identify important dates and ultimately practice visualizing and estimating their workload. So being able to estimate your workload like this by just looking at your Studio calendar um, allows you to, to decide when you're gonna work on things and just think about how much work you actually have on your plate. So now, basically what I've done is I've, I've popped open that task. And what I see here, if we dig a little deeper, is that uh, we can see that the student can add more details to that task. So um, the student sees when the task was assigned by the teacher, but then they're actually required to decide, you know, when they will begin working on that task with respect to due dates. And this helps student really overcome that problem of initiating work. So as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the most important things to do when promoting executive function is to help students initiate work. And that's exactly what Studio does. It says, you've got a task. When are you going to get it started? When are you going to work on it so that it can be done in time for the due date? So students can also break down tasks into individual subtasks. So as I mentioned earlier, you might have big projects or longer term projects that you want to break down into manageable tasks so that students can initiate and get things done. And so what the students can do here, as you can see um, on the screen, 
the, the different due dates. So we have March 22nd, March 24th, March 26th. Each of these represents a specific subtask within this bigger task. And the student can actually create those themselves and decide how they want to break it down. So by simply using Studio as a tool for creating and managing tasks, I'm forced to practice the executive function skills of breaking that down. Um, and this is incredibly helpful when it comes to planning and ultimately executing. Um, so students can also attach files um, to each and every single individual task, um, including documents or pictures of notes that they've taken on, on the board and in the classroom, um, which was a, which was a um, a feature that actually students uh, using Studio requested and that Studio, you know, graciously implemented um, because they know how often it is that students and even adults these days are just taking pictures of notes that they see or important pieces of information that they think are relevant to a task. And then a student who wants to get started can actually just go to this centralized location, the task, pop it open, see the images that are relevant and what they need to do next. So really just a great way to support working memory and having those visual cues and those images there for you as well. Um, and it's all context relevant and promoting the student in, in getting that task started. So next, what we see is um, one of my favorite pages in Studio, um, which, is, which is just an alternative view. So as we know, all of our students learn in different ways. They work in different ways. They all have their own preferences. While, STEM, while some students will probably prefer to work in a weekly calendar or a monthly calendar. Some students might want to see, you know, a, a breakdown of that task and see sort of how it looks uh, or how many days they have to get different things done. And so this task view um, will allow students to do that. So um, if you've used a project management software before, then you might recognize this, um, this, this uh, view, which is similar to a Gantt chart. Um, in this view, students can see how much time they have to actually get a task done um, with respect to the other tasks that they have on their plate and the subtasks at the same time. So if I'm looking at the task um, with the star that says exam, I can see that it has two darker gray dots um, on, its, on its pathway there. And those dark, darker dots actually represent some of the subtasks that I have to get done. Uh, which I can also see on the right hand side um, as they're broken down. Uh, so finish reading final chapter, complete chapter summary, and, and there you have it. And so um, students can uh, have these different views uh, to, to promote planning and to promote an understanding of where they are and ultimately to help students, you know, know themselves better, know their workload better, and allow them to work to their strengths as well. Um, identifying your strengths and knowing how to, how to use those within the process of getting everything done is another crucial executive function skill, um, which Studio promotes. Um, and so this is a really great way to enable everyone, diverse learners in a classroom, also diverse learners and teachers, to use a single tool to really assess what they have to do, to get things done, and to feel good about it. And that's um, this next piece here which I really love, which is about, you know, remembering that, you know, once everything is done, you can take it easy, everything's under control, and it reminds students to relax and really combating that stress piece, because we do know that um, our struggling learners and our highly, um, you know, our higher performing learners all struggle and deal with stress. And so this is a great little reminder that once things are done, it's time to maybe get outside, get some exercise and do something else. Um, so uh, another piece um, that Studio promotes, which is really great, is uh, you know, the homeschool connection, which I mentioned earlier. So another crucial component to um, preventing those blind spots or those pitfalls that I was mentioning earlier um, with respect to implementing executive function in your school is that homeschool connection. And Studio does send weekly reports to parents um, so that they can see a read-only version of their child's planner. They can prepare the week, they can know what needs to get done, they can be aware of, of how to manage their own life schedules and to support their students or their children um, in getting everything done and in setting up an environment at home that can enable getting things done. So really great for uh, bridging that homeschool divide. 
So all in all, um, I believe that, you know, Studio benefits executive function in a number of ways and can reinforce the pedagogical strategies that we use in a number of ways, uh, but primarily correcting uh, the really chaotic uh, digital transition user experience that has resulted from a lot of the changes that we're seeing in today's classroom. So just create a really great student workflow that through the workflow is actually promoting executive function as you're using the tool. It also requires that you use it regularly and consistently. So you're constantly practicing um, all of those skills without even necessarily realizing it. You're practicing executive function skills. You're promoting it at school and at home. You're enabling teachers to also promote it um, as teachers also use Studio. And so teachers then get to model the kinds of behavior they want to see in their students because everyone can use it together. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you can have a whole school using Studio and really seeing that impact, you know, um, school wide, which is incredibly exciting. And um, as you can see here in the bottom left hand corner, uh, a a um, administrator who's shared as well that Studio has given their students more control than ever um, over their schoolwork. And I think at the end of the day, that's really what we're trying to do. That's really what Studio is dedicated to doing, which is giving students agency and the confidence to get things done and to get college and career ready. Um, so the last section of the, of the webinar is really to focus on executive function in school culture. So this is another layer um, that can reinforce the pedagogy, it can reinforce the technology, and this is required because this is about, you know, the change management of it all. This is about making sure that everyone in your school is on board and thinking about how you can promote executive function and also ensuring the adoption of the tools that you're using and ensuring that they're being implemented with fidelity um, so that everyone is on board and in the know. And that, of course, does include uh, families and other stakeholders um, that might be outside of the school. So a school culture is uh, made up of beliefs, perceptions, relationships, attitudes um, that can be written, they can also be unwritten, that shape your everyday um, your everyday life at school and ultimately um, how your school functions. Um, so adding this layer really gets people to exercise executive function without necessarily thinking about it constantly. So the five ways that, uh, that you can promote or reinforce executive function through your school culture, and this is not an exhaustive list, there are certainly many others, um, but this is uh, a really crucial list that I believe can really help. Um, so the first is to uh, to engage in collective strategic planning. So really bringing as many teachers as you can together to ensure that everyone is involved and that everyone is really bought into this idea of executive function within your school culture. And by including uh, different voices and uh, across different courses, across different um, grade levels, you can ensure that everyone will be involved and everyone will be um, thinking about how they can promote this in a consistent way across the school. Um, and so that's incredibly uh, important. And in allowing teachers actually to determine what those indicators of success are together um, and to review and iterate on the practices that you integrate over time. Um, so collecting feedback and, and thinking about how you can move forward with everything that every strategy that you test. Um, second is engaging in teacher training and sensitization activities that will allow teachers to understand their own executive function capacity. So ultimately, you know, as adults, we also may have executive function deficiencies and taking the time as a, as a, as a staff to uh, engage in some activities that will allow you to reflect on your own standing. Uh, can make you really aware of, of how that may or may not be the case with all of your students. And just getting back to that idea of not labeling people, of, of thinking that, you know, not all behavior in a classroom is intentional, and gaining that perspective and that way of looking at your classroom and observing your classroom is, is really easily or, or well supported through this kind of training and sensitization where you take a step back and examine yourself. 
Um, number three is about modeling. Uh, modeling behavior among adults is really key. As we know, I mentioned earlier, we want to model for our students, but we also want to model for each other. So if you're a teacher in a school um, or an administrator or a leader that's thinking about how they can um, promote executive function, well, sticking to the plan, talking about your strategies, sharing what's working in your classroom, and as you do that, other teachers will also see that this is something you're committed to and that you believe is important. Um, you know, sharing, uh, sharing Studio and seeing how you can all use it as a school together, having these conversations are all great ways of, of reinforcing executive functions across the school. And number four is about transparency. So really, if you are committing or, or prioritizing executive function in your school, then share it. Share it as much as you can. Talk to teachers, talk to staff, talk to resource um, personnel, anybody that's helping at the school. Um, also make sure to share this information with parents as much as possible. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, sharing, uh, sharing strategies with parents uh, that they can exercise at home, having a tool like Studio that they can use at school and at home, but then also just sharing the mission and sharing the reason why you're addressing executive function and its relationship to their child's success at the end of the day will make sure that, te that parents are, are also doing everything that they can at home. And then lastly, um, just celebrate students and teachers' successes. So every time um, there's a success of some kind, be it qualitative or quantitative or just, um, you know, an anecdote, but somebody is improving in some way, you know, take the time to, to hear that story as a staff or, or even within your classroom and appreciate that, you know, you've taken a step forward. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's really a journey at promoting executive function. It doesn't happen overnight. And so you need to be sharing those successes throughout the school year and, and over you know, a series of school years because it needs to be an ongoing project. It's never quite over. Um, and so that's another great way to promote executive function in your school culture. Um, I'm just going to uh, take a moment to summarize it all up. So basically, ultimately at the end of the day, if you want to promote executive function, if you want to avoid the common pitfalls that I mentioned, of consistency and regular practice and not having uh, a bridged school home divide, then you'll want to integrate pedagogy. You'll want to have strategies and activities and study tips to promote that with your students as a teacher in the classroom. You'll want to incorporate an ed tech layer that can somehow promote um, and reinforce those pedagogical strategies that you are implementing. And then lastly, you'll want to build a school culture around it all that will constantly be thinking about how to reinforce it within the school and at home with all of your stakeholders in your community. And um, leaders such as yourselves are going to be thinking about developing these plans moving forward. So I sincerely hope that you think about um, uh, thinking through this kind of approach and to talking with, with my friends at Studio about how they might be able to help you do that. Um, so here are some resources that you can um, that you can also look to that were crucial in pulling this presentation uh, together for you all. Um, so do, do read on. And for those of you who are interested in uh, assessment or assessing whether or not uh, where your students are in terms of executive function, do look up brainline.org. So that's brainline, L-I-N-E dot org, which has a series of great resources that can be helpful. Um, and uh, we'll be sure to share that with you all. So thank you to Studio for making this presentation happen. Um, thank you to, to Renault and Brenda at, at Studio who have been a, a great help in pulling all of this together and uh, who I hope you uh, reach out to if you have any questions regarding Studio or executive function plans for your school.